Welcome to Policy On Demand, I'm Cindy Bloom. For anyone who may not remember, in 2017, the road to aligning U.S. tax rules with those of competitor countries was intricate and intense. Before the end of that year, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was enacted, and with it, a new international tax playbook. And now, the Supreme Court has agreed to hear a case that challenges the constitutionality of a key piece of the 2017 law a Section 965 International Reform Transition Tax. Here to get into the why and what's next of this case is Wade Sutton. Wade, welcome. Thank you, good to be here. I wanna start off by congratulating you. You have a new role. You are the new National Tax Services, International Tax Services Leader. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, I'm excited about it. Excellent. So let's get into this case. Could you set the stage for us? What is the impetus for this case being at the Supreme Court? And what are some possible implications? Yeah, so I was actually surprised that the Supreme Court took cert, but before we get into the details of this particular provision, we need to go back to the Constitution and start there. The Constitution has two categories of taxes. There are direct taxes, and those are taxes imposed on people, like a head tax, or on property, or income from property. And then there are indirect taxes, which basically anything else, like sales taxes or excise taxes. And on the direct tax piece, what the Constitution says is that those have to be apportioned amongst the state in proportion to their population. And as a practical matter, that's often a bar to imposing those taxes, right? Because it's a very difficult thing to do, and we don't often do that. Historically, in the early days of the country, most of our revenue was from excise taxes or import duties. But as the case law developed and we realized that apportionment was a bar to income taxes, we got the 16th Amendment in the early 20th century, which basically says, if you have an income tax, even though that's a direct tax, you don't have to apportion that sort of tax. And so that raises a very important question. What is an income tax? And there's a lot of debate about this right now, and that's what is ultimately relevant for this case. And I think traditionally, most people have thought about an income tax as requiring a realization event. And so that's like a transaction or an event that fixes your right to income. So for example, if I invest in a stock and it appreciates, but I haven't done anything, I typically th think I haven't recognized any income. I might be richer on paper, but I haven't had an event that's taxable that crystallizes my income. That ultimately is the issue in this case, is realization a constitutional requirement to have income? So in this particular case, we had two married individuals, the Moors, and they invested in a company in India. I think they had a 13% interest. And over time, that became more valuable and generated some earnings, but they never sold their stock and they never received dividends. So when this transition tax came along in 2017 that you mentioned, they were taxed on the unrepatriated earnings of that entity. And what they're alleging in this case is, hey, we did not have any income in the constitutional sense. We didn't sell our stock, we didn't receive a dividend, and we couldn't even compel the company to pay us a dividend because we controlled 13% of it. We had no say right. in what the company did. And so that um, is ultimately the issue here. Now, it's already been litigated in district and circuit court, and the courts there sided with the government, and they basically said realization is not a constitutional requirement. But there's some disagreement on that, and that's what we're going to find out when the Supreme Court takes this case. So oral arguments we're expecting this fall, and we should have a decision spring of 24. Okay. And who knows how big the impact is going to be. Uh, if you assume that the court rules in favor of the taxpayers, there are a lot of questions about how broad is that ruling. It leaves a lot of questions going forward about this is a load-bearing pillar of the international right. and just general tax system. And so how much is really at stake here is a big question. Right. So the plaintiffs are arguing that Section 965 is imposing tax on personal property, not on income. What happens if this is, ends up being the case? If you imagine that the court has a broad holding where they say you have to have a realization event full stop to have income, it would raise a lot of questions, not just about 965, but about all of our flow-through taxation regimes. So that would include subpart F, it would include guilty, might even include S corporation rules or the partnership rules. And so I think uh, particularly amongst tax academics, there's a lot of concern here about you know, how broad this case is gonna have an impact assuming they even rule in favor of the taxpayers. You're seeing a lot of pieces out there in the tax press right now from academics saying realization is not a constitutional requirement. This has been litigated before and it's a rule of convenience. 
I think people were surprised to see the court take this case. Right. Um, but to take cert, you have to have at least four justices that think this is a question worth answering. And so it doesn't take uh, that much to get a ruling in favor of the taxpayer here if you ultimately have five that, that think that the taxpayer is right. Right. So let's focus on the transition tax. If that has been paid mm -hmm. and companies are wondering, well, what do we do to protect ourselves? What are you seeing right now companies do to basically take protective measures? Yeah, so the immediate step a lot of taxpayers are looking at is filing a claim for protective refund, which is basically preserving your right to go back and amend your return if the court rules in favor of the taxpayer. And you know, certainly people are doing that for 965, the toll charge. Um, but there are a lot of questions about, should we be doing that for other taxes, like subpart F and guilty? Um, and I think just as an immediate step, people should be thinking about those options, just to preserve their ability to claim taxes that, are, that may ultimately be deemed unconstitutional. Um, beyond that, I think people are just waiting to see what happens, and it's gonna be close to a year before we find out that wow, answer. Wow, okay. So could you talk about the potential downstream issues for subpart F and other tax matters? The constitutionality of subpart F has already been litigated at the circuit court level. And what courts have said there is, you know, subpart F and guilty are imposed on controlled foreign corporations, right? And what that means is that because you control the corporation, you have the ability to compel it to pay dividends. And so could be taxable on a constructive receipt of the income earned by the CFC. 965 is a little different. Like in the case of the Moors, you didn't actually need to have a controlled foreign corporation. You could have a minority interest and still be taxed on that amount. And so I think that is one area where this is a particularly sympathetic case. Um, and you, so you can imagine narrow holding that says, okay, just in this situation where you have no control over the entity, it's unconstitutional to tax that income. That's one version of a narrow holding that you could get. But again, just a big open question about where the court goes with this. And, right. and I think one of the big variables is the justices are very smart people, but they're not tax experts. Right. And, and so there's a lot of talk that, you know, maybe they don't quite realize how big of an issue they've really bitten off by granting cert here. So we'll see. So we're talking about a period of waiting mm -hmm. uh, to see what happens. But what are companies to do in the meantime? I mean, you said you got to watch this very closely, but anything you're seeing that companies are doing? Well, the other uh, thing that I'm seeing is this has spurred add-on litigation. So recently, Altria filed a claim in the Eastern District of Virginia challenging their taxes in, in light of the repeal of 958B4. And that was a provision that turned off attribution for CFC status if you had foreign ownership. And they're basically claiming in that context hey, we're a minority owner just like the Moors were, and therefore the tax that you impose on us is also unconstitutional under the 16th Amendment. So I think taxpayers are exploring that angle, but otherwise, aside from the protective refunds, I think it's a lot of wait and see. Right, right. Well, that was a, a lot of detail, and I really appreciate you getting us through that. Thanks for being here, Wade. Yeah, thanks for having me. And thank you, as always, for watching, and stay with Policy on Demand for the latest developments in Washington and around the world. Take care.